it's time to go back to Back to the Future 2. Back to Back to the Future 2, because we are now in the future of Back to the Future, part 2. Today, October 21st, 2015, is the day that Marty McFly arrived with Doc in his magic-y, science -y time travel car after traveling 30 years into the future in the classic hit film Back to the Future Part 2. And yes, that makes me feel super old. Also sad, because we still don't have flying time travel cars. But Back to the Future made a lot of other predictions about what kinds of technology would be available by now, so how did they do? better than you might think. The thing is, not every field advances at the same rate. In some areas, we are actually ahead of where the movies said we'd be, and then in others, not so much. The fusion-powered flying cars, for example. Let's start with the stuff for Marty's future that we have. It's not so surprising that Back to the Future predicted a lot of this stuff, because it actually existed when the movie was made in 1989. And they were all made possible by sophisticated high-speed electronic information handling based on the same fundamental technology, the silicon microchip. Google Glass, cell phones, biometric scanners, even your TV, they got microchips in them. Video calls on the internet? Those wouldn't be part of your everyday life if there weren't computers powerful enough and fast enough to use them, and if those computers weren't in businesses and homes. We have a couple of things that Back to the Future didn't see coming, just little things like cell phones and the internet, and those things were around in 1989. Now, the first commercially available mobile phone went on sale in 1983. Sure, it weighed almost two pounds, but it was out there. Since 1969, and definitely in the 1980s, researchers were already making use of ARPANET, which was like the starter Pokemon version of what would eventually evolve into the internet. So that's what we have. That's where, if anything, we've exceeded Back to the Future's optimistic version of 2015. The silicon microchip has revolutionized the world we live in. Not that the microchip is the only thing thing we needed to make this technology happen. Take video conferencing as an example. To become as cheap and widespread as it is now, we didn't just have to solve hardware problems. It wasn't just creating a powerful enough microchip or launching satellites, we also had to solve software problems, like how to send live video and audio data, which is a huge amount of data, two ways between two computers. This happened with the invention of Network Voice Protocol in 1973. NVP would eventually evolve into VoIP, or Voice over IP, the system we still use to video conference today. This was was huge. See, conventional phone calls operate via circuit switching. Basically, when you call someone, a connection is made between your phone and their phone along actual wires that stays open for the duration of the call. It's called a circuit because you're connecting two points in both directions. It used to be done on copper wires, now it's done on fiber optic cables. Both are really wasteful because the line stays open both ways even when you're not saying anything, so it's just sending silence. NVP and VoIP use packet switching instead, which means they only send data when there's data to send. If you're not saying anything, Thing, the connection closes. If you don't move, it doesn't send any new video information. When you do talk, they make what's called a packet of that new data and open a connection just long enough to send it through. It's way more efficient, and it means the connection has to handle way less data. Video calls wouldn't be possible without packet switching technology. And in order to have things like cell phones or wearable computer glasses, we had to develop an effective power source to run them on. The private eye computer glasses that were invented in 1989 needed a battery you carried around in a backpack. That was never gonna take off. Now, Google Glass runs off a lithium polymer battery that fits into the stem of the headpiece. High-end lithium-ion batteries have about twice the energy density of any other kind of battery, but they didn't really catch on until the 21st century. Because lithium explodes, like, all the time. It's a volatile metal. It took decades of testing to develop protection circuits that would make lithium-ion batteries safe to use. Modern lithium-ion batteries have built-in surge protectors, overcharge protection, and a vent that releases any buildups of explosive gas. Packing all that into a tiny battery was a major engineering hurdle. And every once in a while, they still blow up. But that's the stuff that we do have now. Let's get back to Marty's future and take a look at the fields where we've fallen short of the future from the movie, because no other field has grown as fast as electronics and computing technology. We've made a lot of progress in the last 26 years, but the progress has not exactly been symmetrical. The movie imagined a future where every aspect of the world we live in would be way more advanced than the world of 1989. With gadgets and computers, we got that. Other stuff? Not so much. We're gonna get to the flying cars eventually, but first, let's talk about medical technology. Back to the Future predicted that we'd have so-called rejuvenation clinics, a place where Doc could go get his blood changed out and add 30 or 40 years to his life. That sounded preposterous for most of the last 30 years, but it turns out it's maybe actually a thing? A 2014 study in the journal Nature Medicine showed that injecting the blood of young mice into old mice dramatically improved their synaptic plasticity. The connections in their brains responsible for learning and memory got stronger. The old mice also experienced a burst of 
brain cell growth as well as increased activity across the hippocampus, the part of the brain that begins deteriorating first with old age. They also had three to four times as many new neurons as untreated old mice. Other studies have shown that young blood activates stem cells in old mice, allowing them to heal wounds faster, much like a younger animal. At the same time, young mice, when given old blood, become sluggish, have difficulty remembering things, and heal more slowly. The reason for this appears to be the increase and decline of certain proteins in the blood. Old mice, like old humans, have high levels of a protein called CCL11 in their blood. If you inject CCL11 into young mice, their learning and memory decline. B2M, a protein that peaks in the blood of old mice and old humans, also impairs memories of young mice when it's injected. Scientists who study aging now believe that among the hundreds of substances found in blood, there are proteins that keep tissues youthful and proteins that make them more aged. Scientists have proposed that when we're born, our blood is full of proteins that help our tissues grow and heal. Then, when we get older, the levels of those proteins drop. That might be because the tissues that produce them just wear out. Whatever the reason, as the young making proteins dry up from your blood, your body starts to deteriorate. So it may be that having your blood changed can effectively make you younger, though you'd need to keep getting new injections since your blood cells are constantly being replaced. But this is all very new science, which has so far only been tested on mice. So please don't go around doing anything weird like buying up young blood when you get older. Give the science a couple more decades to catch up with the future in the movie. Back to the Future also predicted a world where bionic implants were common, like the guy with eye implants that would have given them x-ray vision if they weren't on the fritz, or the Major League Baseball pitcher who got suspended for playing with an improperly calibrated bionic arm. The word bionic means an interface between biology and electronics, or technology, that tries to imitate life. And in the 30 years since Marty traveled through time, we've come up with some pretty cool bionics. We have prosthetic limbs you can control with your mind, cochlear implants that provide sound information to your brain, and artificial hearts that doctors can plug into your chest to pump your blood for you. But we don't have the kind of sophisticated bionics we hear about in the movie. Why? Right now, the most innovative technique we have for prosthetics involves rerouting the nerves with a procedure known as targeted muscle re -innervation. So if you wanted, like, a bionic arm, they would dissect your shoulder and actually pull out the major brachial nerves that normally go down your arm and put them back into your chest. Your prosthetic arm would then have electrodes that would fit over those relocated nerves to pick up the signals from your brain. Because your brain thinks those nerves are still in your arm, even if you don't have an arm anymore. So if it tells your arm to bend at the elbow, that signal would go to your chest and be picked up by an electrode which would relay the information to the prosthetic. But this only works for major muscle motions. We currently just don't understand how thought becomes tiny complex movements well enough to be able to turn that into mechanical data. The next step will involve neural implantation, which is sticking sensors into your brain. That is dangerous and complicated and still very experimental, but those experiments are happening. In December of 2012 at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, a 52-year-old quadriplegic was able to control the movement of a robotic arm through brain control computer interface technology, thanks to having two computer chips implanted in the motor cortex in her head. But there's still work to be done. For one thing, we have to make sure it's safe before we roll that out onto the market. Now. Flying cars. Yeah, flying cars. There are two of them currently in development, the Terrafugia TFX and the Aeromobile. The TFX uses collapsible, kind of concealable, battery-powered rotor blades to lift off, and moves into forward flight using a gasoline-powered propeller-like fan for thrust. The twin collapsible propellers fold under the car when it's a car. When it's not a car, it looks like a weirdly car-like helicopter. The good news is that operating the TFX will not require a pilot's license, because the craft will fly itself. The bad news is that it's at least ten years away from being on sale. The Aeromobile looks more like a small airplane than a helicopter with a fixed propeller tail. It also has two fold-out wings instead of the helicopter -y propellers used by the TFX. According to its developers, the Aeromobile might be commercially available as soon as 2017 for only a couple hundred thousand dollars. Both of these options are essentially very small planes or helicopters that have been designed to also be able to drive on roads and look kind of like a car while doing it. Both have ground speeds of approximately 160 kilometers per hour and flight speeds of approximately 200 kilometers per hour, and they can fly as far as 600 to 700 kilometers. So they're not quite cars with levitating propulsion jets like you see in Back to the Future, but it's a start. Overall, I think we did pretty well. If you look back through history, scientific progress is almost always asymmetrical. There are big breakthroughs like the microchip or the microscope, or even the printing press, if you want to go really far back, that open up new possibilities for lots of little breakthroughs. Some fields benefit from those breakthroughs more than others, and this is the case with the microchip making computer-based technology zoom ahead. So what is the next big breakthrough going to be? I don't know, but it's going to be cool to find out if the world changes as much in the next 26 years as it has since 1989. Thank you for watching this episode of SciShow. Now, if you're wondering why we didn't talk about hoverboards, it's because we have a whole episode on hoverboards. Just talk about hoverboards. So, 
Click on that if you want to watch that. This episode of SciShow is brought to you by our patrons on Patreon. If you want to help support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash scishow. And don't forget to go to youtube.com slash scishow and subscribe.